Hey there Dango Stu here. Today's video is about doing some more work on the trawler's deck and in the engine bay, about fixing the generator and is proudly sponsored by marineengine.com. Alright, we'll start off by looking at some repairs I did to the deck before the generator actually broke. The idea here was just getting a few last things that I had missed fixed so that we can put the insulation in without damaging it by welding. To plug this hole in the deck, I've got this 12 millimeter rod. I've cut this one a bit too long, but never mind, we can grind it down. Then what I'm doing is actually drilling with a 10 millimeter drill bit. And with a bit of an interference fit. Tap it in. Then I'm gonna weld around it, grind it off. So once they were welded up, I just ground them flat. It's getting sandblasted, so I'm not worried about the grinding being too smooth or anything. The reason a couple of these bits got missed is that what looks like quite a small amount of rust, by the time you chip it with the hammer, can actually end up going all the way through. So it really won't be to be sandblast that I'll know the true extent of what needs repairing, but I've got to push on for now. Uh, this is the curved section that I was working on quite a while ago. This is actually some old footage. So I ended up just using the old uh, you know, lever on a, uh, a dog welded to the combing to push it in while I uh, welded it in place. Hitting with a hammer, got it in, particularly once it was warm from welding as well. Ugh. Fuel is pouring out of this carburetor on the generator. You can see how wet the deck is here. That's just petrol running out of this generator. It's weird. I think it's got a sticking needle and seat. Here we go, look at that. Pouring out. All right, shut the fuel off. Take that carburet off. I took the bowl off and just actuated the float and it's moving fine. So it could be the needle itself, I don't know, although yeah, weird. Anyway, we'll take it off. Two steps forward, one step back. Uh, how's that attached? Under there. Air filter. Air filter housing. Alright. Alright, just stuck a screwdriver in the fuel hose because the fuel cock is on the carburetor unit itself which we are removing and there's just the governor governor spring here now Why are you leaking so badly, little carburetor? So, it's that way. This is the bowl I took off in situ. Just to make sure the uh, float was working. Mm. Little pivot for the float. It's brand new. I really don't understand. I mean, that needle in the seat looks good. Looks fine. See that water down there? That's great excitement. That's rain. Finally, we got a little bit, not a lot, but still rainwater. All these patches, I've now put some phosphoric acid on. They had rusted pretty quickly, so I just put that on to treat the rust. I'm just going to brush this off with a hand brush. I'm not going to go nuts with a angle grinder brush or anything because I want to leave this, I think it's iron phosphate or whatever that, that the phosphoric acid converts the rust to. And it's actually a pretty good adhesion to the steel so I'll just brush the loose stuff off 
and then I'm going to put some of this on. Bear in mind though that this is still temporary in the sense, the repair's not, that'll last forever, you know, well, as long as I want the boat for anyway. Uh, but I am eventually going to have this entire deck sandblasted and epoxy coated, non-slip, all that kind of stuff. So this is really about just stopping it rusting until that day comes. It's certainly pretty chunky, so it's going to take a pretty, pretty good stir. Oh, and in case you're wondering, when I bought the reciprocating saw, I got a set of blades that came with some metal, some woodworking blades. I'm never going to use it for cutting wood, so it's getting uh, repurposed as my stirrer. That actually took quite a bit of stirring. It's definitely got a serious amount of seriousness in it. Anyway, almost there, then we'll brush it on. A few lumps still at the bottom. All right, just starting to clean the bilge out now, getting all the dust from grinding and all that kind of stuff out, getting ready for the engine to go in, finish a little bit of plumbing so we can get the uh, fuel tanks filled. I've never actually cleaned anything before and I've got to say it's uh, kind of oddly satisfying. What I'm going to do now is push a cable through to the wheelhouse that's going to be all our engine controls and sensors. This cable is from uh, an outboard motor, so it's a manufacturer's outboard control cable that goes to the outboard from the forward control. Uh, what is it? Uh, one, two, three, seven core. So I'm going to push this through. I'm going to use this for all my control cables and sensor cables. This is a little junction box I've got to go on the board here, and this has. Oh, as you can see, uh, little spade connectors on it. So I'm going to terminate all these wires with female spade connectors and then we'll hook it up to here. One thing I learned from last time I used these connectors is don't hit them with the heat gun until they're on because the heat shrink is so powerful that it actually closes up the female spade connector and you can't get it on. So put it on, hit them with the heat gun, put them on properly, and uh, not only will it shrink up, but it actually won't come off. So that's the plan. Currently I have no 240 volt power on the boat because the inverter died. It just goes into a fault mode when I turn it on. So I'm gonna give that to Leon to have a look at. Uh, and the carburetor on the generators, cactus. Since I've been working on the trawler, I've had lots of great comments from people who really know this stuff when it comes to engines, boats, all sorts of things. And I think it kind of wrongly gives me the impression that all the viewers sort of know what's going on a lot of the time. And that became particularly clear with the electrical stuff where I didn't really explain it, you know, in as much detail as perhaps I could have, which made it hard for people to follow. As a result of that, I'm going to go back to explaining uh, a few more things in detail. Obviously, some of you will know this stuff, but I know plenty others don't. So, you know, I may as well go back into teaching a bit more. As a result of that, I'm now going to go through the fault with this carburetor on the generator and explain what's happening with it. I'm going to draw it out on this bit of cardboard. I actually did find a little bit of simple animation software that I'm going to start playing with, see if I can lift my game a little bit, but in the meantime. So what you have at the bottom of the carburetor is a bowl like this, and that's where you have a reservoir of fuel ready for the carburetor to deliver. Inside this bowl, excuse my dodgy drawings, there is a float. And this is the float from that carburetor. I think it goes this way. And it pivots on a point, and then the float sort of comes up. I think it comes up in this case. And then here is what's called the needle. And it looked like this. Then the needle goes up into the seat, which is a similar shape like this, and it mates with it. Fuel comes in. When the fuel level in the carburetor drops down low, the float goes down with it. A gap then opens up between the needle and the seat and fuel runs in. In and outboard, that's pushed into the carburetor via a fuel pump, but in the case of the Honda, it is gravity fed because the tank's up high. Now, what happened with this one is somehow the float 
ended up half full of fuel, which meant that even when the fuel level was quite high, the float sank down to the bottom and fuel just kept running. The entire fuel tank essentially just emptied through here into the carburetor. What happens then? A couple of things happen. The height that this float sits in normal operation determines how much of the emulsion tube inside here is in fuel and has a big effect on how rich the engine's running. So the first thing I noticed, it was running really badly. It just wasn't running as well as it used to. Then what happened is when I wasn't using the engine, because with a fuel pump, when the engine stops running, fuel no longer gets pumped. Because this is gravity fed, with the float in this position sunk to the bottom of the bowl, fuel could just run through. It would fill up the carburetor completely. Then it actually came out through the throat of the carburetor and then ran down through an open intake valve. So it came in, fuel came in, through an open valve, piston tops here. This is a bad drawing, sorry. Then you've got your spark plug coming in here, the little electrode. So fuel came in through an open valve, came in here, filled up the cylinder. When I tried to pull it over, it did what they call a hydrolock because you can't compress liquid. So you just physically couldn't pull the string. Then pull the spark plug out, pull the cord, all the fuel could shoot out through the spark plug hole and we're kind of back in business. Once that was done, it was fine. It's just a pull start, so no bent con rods, because that can happen if you hydrolock an engine, but in this case, we're fine. Now, this can potentially be very dangerous. It's funny, uh, a lot of people sort of, you know, mentioned about uh, grinding sparks and slag from plasma cutting going on the LPG bottle in the last video. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's actually not very dangerous. LPG's pure fuel, no oxygen. It can't explode as such, you know. Um, if they get really, really hot, like if an LPG bottle is in a bushfire, for example, um, they can explode if they heat up really quickly because of the pressure inside, but they also have pressure release valves. I think there's even like a lead plug that will melt and then it'll just vent the LPG and it'll burn. Uh, in some training I did with the fire brigade, we'd actually light an LPG bottle. Then you have two of you on a nozzle, like an L-cut nozzle or something like that, and um, you get like a wide fan and you sort of approach that using that fan of water as a shield and then someone can actually reach out and turn the tap off. So we do quite a bit of training with burning LPG bottles. And they don't blow up, you know. You'd have to add so much oxygen for them to do that, and it's just not there. You'd have to add, like, lots of liquid oxygen. So at the end of the day, looks dangerous, but it's actually not. But the reason I tell this story is that things like this don't look particularly dangerous, but they are. Because if this generator had been stowed below deck, it would have dumped an entire fuel tank of fuel into the bilge, which then on a hot day in a steel boat would have turned to a huge amount of fuel vapor, which is highly flammable and has just that right ratio of fuel to oxygen to actually burn this stoichiometric mixture, um, which the LPG doesn't have. So although this doesn't look spectacular on film and look dangerous, doesn't have people spitting their coffee across the room, it's actually far more dangerous than the LPG bottle. So that's one of the reasons why you don't store petrol, either in jerry cans or petrol powered devices below deck. Diesel much, much, much safer. Another point worth making is that on the carburetor here, there is a fuel shutoff and that would have stopped the fuel. So if I was in the habit of turning that off after I'd finished with it, it wouldn't have actually drained out. The float bowl would have still sunk, but it would have been stopped at the fuel cock before it got to the needle and seat. Anyway, so that's what's happening here. Sorry I haven't been explaining things so much. I know some people go, yeah, I know all about this, but there are plenty who don't. So I think it's worth going back and, you know, going through it. So I think, all right, no power, that's bad, I need power. So I bought a new float, which on the surface things looks really similar, except for the way the needle attaches. It came with its own needle, which is fine, but it's got a huge variation here. And when you close it up, when I lift the float bowl to its fully raised position, I can still very easily blow through the uh, fuel inlet, wherever it's gone to, here, and it doesn't shut it off. If I put just the needle in, I can shut it off. So this doesn't appear to be compatible with this carburetor. Kind of doesn't surprise me, it was advertised as a Honda 390 float, but it wouldn't surprise me if the Honda GX390 engine has different carburetors with different production runs, I don't know. Anyway, so, 
In order to get power back in the meantime, I'm going to A, take a photo of this one so that I can find the right one, but B, just try and drain it. It's weird, like it doesn't... I've not had a drop of this fuel come back out. I've been shaking it, seeing if I can see the tiniest bit of moisture anywhere, and I just can't, you know, I can't see where it got in. So I'm tempted just to drill it, empty it, plug it with some sort of fuel resistant sealant, and then use it until the correct one arrives. Then of course, I'll just keep running it forever and keep the other one as a spare if it doesn't fail again, because you know, when am I gonna get around to changing it if it's working? Anyway, so let's drill this, drain it, try and seal it, try and get some power back on the boat. I'm a little bit torn whether to drill the top because it's the higher section and maybe out of the fuel, or to actually drill the bottom because as you all know, if you turn a cup of water upside down, you know, liquid doesn't come into it if you push it into a sink, for example. You know, I am gonna drill the highest point. I think this is probably out of the fuel, the highest point. Just a little one mil drill bit. Get this fuel out. I really can't see where it went in, but you know, it worked for a while. I think it was a manufacturing fault. I think it's always had the leak but it must just be very, very slow. So it's gonna sink again. But by the time it does that, the correct part will have arrived and we'll be in business. Now all I gotta do is figure out what I'm gonna seal it with. To try and seal this up again, I'm gonna give it a little bit of a sand. And I'm gonna take a bit of the plastic from the old one that I can't use, or the other one I can't use, the new one I can't use. See if we can uh, melt it. Interesting. That might have actually worked. Things I do don't normally work. Hmm. You gave your life so the old one could live. Thank you. I reckon we put that back together. Give it a whirl. Looks pretty good to me. Pirate life. Gotta be the best beer for a boat, hasn't it? Let's get this back together. So, old float, old needle. It just sort of hooks in and hangs there. Drop it in, hopefully, there we go. Get the pivot pin back in. So the other thing I often do is, uh, let's have a look. So it's blowing. So you can see it's working properly. All right, float bowl back on. Now I want to be able to get to the drain. Uh, it goes on the carburetor that way. So I want the drain screw here facing me. Short one, yep, and a fibre washer to stop this bolt leaking on the bottom. And then we'll just snip this up. Don't want to deform the bowl and uh, cause leaks. Look, this is the choke lever. So this little lever just actuates the choke, and this one is your throttle plate. Chokes forward of the venturi so that if you open the throttle but close off the choke like this at the front as the piston goes down it pulls a really strong vacuum in here and draws a lot of fuel out until you open the choke and then the vacuum just becomes lighter and you get the correct measured amount from the venturi okay i think we're in business vacuum plate screwdrivers let's go 
Okay, back together. Let's uh, fill this up with fuel and see if it leaks. All right, fuel on, no leaks. Choke on. Ignition on. Success. Just reinstalling the fuel lines now so we can start getting some fuel to the tanks. Alright, tanks are now officially sealed again. Um, I've got to do a little bit more welding above the port side tank though, so I'm not going to put fuel in them yet. Because we've been getting closer and closer to driving this boat, I've been checking a few things. Rudder still turns nicely, no drummers there. But these Morse cables have seized up, which is kind of pretty common. So I'm going to crack open the forward controls and I'm actually going to swap them out. I'm not going to repair them. Come this far and I've actually got some at home anyway. So I just got to get them out and measure the lengths of them. There we go. Okay, looks like a little sir clip on here. Pop that off. Let it fly across the wheelhouse. Buy a new one. Done. All right, there's the two saddles in there. Two flathead, two Phillips head. Looks like it's going much easier just to pull some slack through. Deal with it out here. Oh dear, that's why that was being a nightmare. Back one's a huge bent screw. Way too long. <sighs> what are we gonna do about that? I think maybe even bolt cutters. In the absence of power or a hacksaw. Use my cloth as a grip. Lady gave me this cloth she crocheted when uh, I was in, in the US. Very sweet. Just going to take a little picky of this before I uh, get it right apart. All right, I'm going to pull these cables right through, then take these ends off. But I'm also just going to say roughly where they're adjusted. For example, this one looks like it's adjusted all the way in. So, you know, it's just good to know that for reassembling it. I'll take the locking nuts off. I'm pretty sure the cables come with locking nuts, but we'll keep them just to be safe. One of the first uh, vaguely useful videos ever made actually was on repairing these cables using an air compressor to push oil down inside them and free them up again. I'll put a link to it, but in this case, I'm just gonna replace them. We've come way too far, I think. Also, you know, you look at this, This one's chafed right through on something. So yeah, yeah, this is the seized one too. I think the other one's probably usable, but you know. Ugh, very muggy today, very still. Wind picks up later on going for a sail, which will be nice, but until then we sweat. All right, let's have a look if there's any numbers on these cables, which will tell us the length, otherwise we'll have to measure them. So here you can see, it's the cable we need to order. All right, looks like this one's mm, 7.5, so 6.25 and 7.5. Well, thanks for watching. Uh, I'll now get on and order those cables so we can get those swapped out. I obviously didn't make this 22nd December deadline to try and get this running to go fishing. Um, look, it was highly unrealistic, but that's okay. It's kind of nice sometimes to have a, uh, a deadline to aim for, whether you make it or not. As Douglas Adams once said, you know, I really like deadlines. I really love the wishing sound they make as they go by. 
Oh, also had a lot of, uh, you know, complaints about none of my clocks working, so I've solved this one by replacing it with a bit of bling, and I've actually ordered a new one for the wheelhouse. The reason I ordered a new one, rather than replacing the clock mechanism, is it was becoming pretty obvious that because it was quite an old unit, that I couldn't actually trust the, you know, the thermometer, barometer, uh, all this kind of stuff. Um, they were obviously out of calibration. I wrote to the company who manufactures it, uh, asking about, you know, testing, calibrating, whatever, and never got a reply. So I figure, you know, I'll just replace it. There were other models that maybe I would have liked in exchange, but as you'll have seen, the whole wall's quite heavily faded behind it, so replacing it with a smaller model would have actually, um, you know, involved quite a lot of work to try and blend in the colours on the timber, so too hard. All right, well, take care, and I will catch you next week. See ya. All right, gonna head out to the boat now and fix the generator. But before we have to run the gauntlet past the chicken, so we may as well do our uh, D squad update. Dottie's up. You notice she's missing a lot of her comb too. She wasn't just broody, she had got attacked by a bush turkey. It's a hard life as a chicken, isn't it? And um, pecked all the comb off her head. There you go, have some food. And um, I think it took her a while to get used to the fact that he wasn't around anymore. Eat your greens, not just your worms. <laughs> Daisy's by far the most skittish of the two or the three. So this one's a wine dot, this is a bantam. There's Daffy, it's not like her to be hiding when there's food. You didn't let Daisy have any of them, did you? Your gobble guts? Is there any left? No, you've eaten all the worms. All right, so Dottie's back in action. Daisy's as skittish as she ever is, <laughs> and God knows where Daffy's gone. Daisy's also molting massively at the moment. All right. You hiding, Daffy? Yes, you are. Oh, look how many eggs we got today. What's up with you? It's okay, just chill. Chill, Winston. Oh, what are you doing? Anyway, there's some food if you want it. Thanks for the eggs. They all lay different colour eggs. But I'll show you once we've got one of each. Oh, there we go, there's another one. Another two. Man. Bonus. Yeah, you're hungry now, aren't you? Um, <laughs> you can't eat through the mesh. Daffy lays the brown ones, Dottie lays the white ones, and Daisy lays blue ones, blue-green. But she's not laying at the moment because she's molting. All right. All right, let's go do some work. <laughs>